Great. Hello. So my name is Diego, as you know, and I work as a principal engineer at Atlassian in Sydney, Australia. I want to start by saying big thank you to Professor Labra and the University of Oviedo for inviting me to come back to the university, even if by video conference, and for offering me this opportunity to talk to uh, you. I also want to acknowledge that this is uh, a time of hardship for all of us. Considering the current situation, I'm really grateful that you have found the time to listen to me. I will do my best to make it worth um, uh, of your time by sharing with you some of my experience and hopefully by keeping you entertained along the way. In particular, I'm going to share with you the story of uh, Atlassian's journey from our first microservice to having approximately a thousand of them in production. This presentation will take uh, roughly half an hour and there will be plenty of time for QA at the end. But before that, let me introduce myself. Uh, I was born in Oviedo and I started programming uh, in basic when I was uh, only 10 years old. I then studied at the University of Oviedo at a time when only a few computers had access to the internet and the students had to hand their projects using floppy disks or printing the code. After a few years at Oviedo, I moved to Gijón to continue studying there. And around those years, I was also very active in the free software and the Linux community before it became mainstream. I worked as a sysadmin before pivoting to a researcher role at the CTIC Foundation in Gijón, where I spent seven years writing papers about the semantic web and applying for R&D grants. And then in 2012, I made the decision that it was the right moment to leave Asturias and I accepted a job as a software engineer in Sydney. You will hear more about that in a moment, but before moving on, you may want to know that uh, when I'm not doing software, then you will probably find me hiking at the mountains or reading books about the golden age of space exploration. So for the last seven years, I have been living in Sydney. I'm sure you will recognize the Sydney Opera House and the Harbour Bridge, which are the icons of the city. But uh, there is much more to see here. I hope that uh, at some point in your lives, you will have the chance to visit this place, which is literally on the other side of the world, but also the opposite to Asturias in more than one way. The reason that took me here is that Sydney is the location of the Atlassian headquarters. You probably have heard of a number of Atlassian products like Jira, Confluence, Trello, Bitbucket, Status Page, or Obsini. I got a job here in 2012, and at that time, Atlassian was a successful startup with 400 employees. Nowadays, uh, Atlassian is a publicly traded company with 10 times more employees, offices all around the world, a large portfolio of customers that includes some of the biggest brands in the world and more than $1 billion in revenue. Our mission is to unleash the potential in every team and our goal is to have 100 million active users. The reason I'm sharing these numbers is because my talk is all about the scaling. So I thought it would be interesting for you to get an idea of how much Atlassian has already grown and how ambitious it is in terms of future growth. So now I will tell you a story of how Atlassian grew from uh, the point of view uh, of an engineer. To understand that growth, first we have to travel back in time. It has been said by me that a year in the cloud equals 20 years in the real world. So by that rule, this story commences almost 100 years ago. The year is 2014 and the world looked very different to the world that we know today. Up to that moment, Atlassian had been very successful selling software licenses, and now it was transitioning into the cloud, while at the same time experiencing strong growth. Our first attempts to convert our monolithic products like Jira and Confluence into online services were not very cost efficient. Even worse, we were struggling to move fast. With hundreds of engineers contributing code to a single deployable bundle, we were lucky if we could deploy twice per month. We used to have these big go, no go meetings before releasing. If one team said that they needed more time to test their changes, then the release train would stop for everyone. For example, if the tests for email notifications in Jira were failing, that would prevent me from deploying a change in the color of the login button. And then when we finally deployed, it was a, a very stressful time because there were many changes in that release and investigating which one of those changes was causing, for example, a performance regression was very complex. Back then, some people brought into Atlassian the idea of microservices as a pattern that we could use to unbundle our software 
and turn it into more manageable pieces that could be independently and continuously deployed by small teams. And so our journey began. Over the next years, we encountered a number of challenges in our way. For dramatic purposes, I have reduced them to just four, and in the rest of this talk, I'm going to present them in sequence. But that's just a simplification for storytelling purposes. The reality is much more complex. Let's get started and talk about the first challenge that we encountered. Remember, our goal was to decompose some monoliths with many millions lines of code into microservices so we could continue growing but still move fast. How did we go about doing that? Well, one thing that we could have done was to buy many copies of Sam Newman's excellent book on building microservices and give them to our engineers and just tell the engineers to follow the book. Easy. Unfortunately, the beginning of our journey was not that easy. Firstly, this book, which you should definitely read, was not published until 2015, so it came a bit late for us. Secondly, as you will learn once you leave the university, there is a difference between reading about the theory and putting it in practice at scale. We naively started building microservices, and soon we found ourselves with pockets of services scattered across the organization using the different AWS accounts. Service integration was hard, and the only people who knew how to deploy a service were the people who had created it. We realized that in order to succeed in this journey, we would have to enable every engineer at Atlassian to easily develop and deploy secure services. We searched the market for a platform that we could use for this purpose, but in those ancient times, we couldn't find any. So we took the decision to build our own platform for microservices, which we call Micros. Micros is Atlassian's internal platform as a service. It is built on top of AWS CloudFormation. Its primary goal is not to abstract the details of AWS so we could one day maybe move to a different cloud provider. No. Instead, Micros aims to simplify and standardize how we use the AWS resources. For example, it defines a uniform service and network architecture with a load balancer, an auto-scaling group, and a stateless EC2 computing nodes. Service owners can easily attach resources to their services, like S3 buckets, queues, or databases. Everything is declared using configuration as code in a file that we call the service descriptor. The Micros platform is opinionated, and it pushes services to adopt the 12-factor app model, which Professor Labra has already covered an hour ago. That means, for example, that configuration is externalized, logs are centralized, and exactly the same artifact is deployed in all the environments. Micros defines a small but strict contract between the service and the platform. This contract specifies how the service must be packaged, how it exposes its API, how it can be monitored, and how to collect the observability data, like metrics and logs. Micros also introduces uniformity in the environments and the AWS regions that we use. It provides a single command that every service uses to deploy or roll back in any environment. In other words, even if you don't know uh, anything about the service and you have never met its creators, you can still deploy it to production. To deploy any service in Micros, two things are needed. Firstly, you have to package your service as a Docker container. And secondly, you have to write the service descriptor file that declares how you want your service to be deployed. That service descriptor indicates how many EC2 instances to use or which DynamoDB tables to create. Then you run a command, which, as I said, is the same for every service, and Micros takes care of progressively deploying the service in AWS without downtime using a blue-green deployment model. I do not have time today to go into the details of Micros, so if you want to learn more, two of the real experts on Micros have given talks that you can find in YouTube. Note that Micros is continuously evolving, and some of the information in those talks may be already outdated, but the principles of the platform remain the same. We built a number of tools around the Micros platform. For example, this one that you can see here provides a UI to inspect the services. This is just a taste of what the tool has to offer. I can select any service and get a report of its service level objectives and indicators, also known as SLIs and SLOs. 
For example, I can see that this particular service called user preferences has met its goals for availability, latency, and reliability over the last month. If you want to learn more about SLIs and SLOs, please check Google's free SRE book that Labra cited before. We created the Micros platform so Atlassian engineers could deploy their services. But those services needed to talk to each other. How could services authenticate each other's requests? We did not want to rely only on network security, among other reasons because we knew that not all the services would be on the Micros platform. For example, this is the case of new companies that Atlassian has acquired over time, like Trello or Opsini. It was also important for us to minimize the coordination required between teams. For example, we did not want teams to have to exchange a secret before services could talk to each other. In order to do this, we built a service-to-service -service authentication protocol, which we call ASAP. It is based on asymmetric cryptography and JWT tokens, and it is a simplified version of OAuth. I would love to discuss more about ASAP, but uh, again, I do not have time today. The good news is that both the ASAP specification and its implementations are open source. Just follow the link that appears on the screen to learn more about it. ASAP can be used both inside and outside Micros. Of course, it is very well integrated with our Micros platform. For example, services running in Micros automatically receive a private key to sign their requests. That private key is transparently rotated for additional security. Micros and ASAP are the foundations of a secure platform. Not only services can verify the authenticity of the request they receive, we can also run security scans across our platform, for example, to detect vulnerable services or dependencies. And we provide a secret store to inject secrets into the services. But there is much more value unlocked by uh, the Micros platform. For example, it simplifies compliance, but making sure that every change, every commit deployed to production has been first peer uh, reviewed and tested. It locks engineers like me out of our services and uh, their data. For example, I cannot open a terminal and SSH into an EC2 box, and I cannot query the production database, even for my own services. I simply do not have that access. The platform also raises the bar for resilience. We perform periodic failover tests in production, where we just pull the plug for a whole AWS availability zone to make sure that everything continues to work and customers do not notice a thing. This is completely transparent to the service owners. The platform also provides chaos engineering, similar to the popular chaos monkey from Netflix, and it automates all the backups. Finally, the platform provides individual and aggregated visibility over all the services. For example, as a service owner, I can see how much it costs to run my service, so I can make decisions to optimize those costs. I also have access to centralized logs and metrics, which are very useful to detect and troubleshoot problems. So let's continue with our story. Once we built a secure foundation for microservices, teams at Atlassian started building hundreds of services on top of it. And then is when we encountered the second challenge. Some people say that one of the advantages of microservices is that you can individually choose the best technology for each one. However, we learned that this freedom comes with some inefficiencies. Soon we found ourselves with dozens of programming languages, web frameworks, build tools, databases, message middlewares, etc. The proliferation of technologies created pockets of localized knowledge. It became harder to contribute or understand someone else's code base. Developers and services had less mobility across teams and hiring became harder. And most importantly, knowledge and best practices did not easily flow between teams. Our solution was to pick a handful of tech stacks and put our weight behind them. We carefully uh, choose tech stacks for front end, for mobile, and for backend services. And then for each one of uh, these tech stacks, we gather the knowledge of the teams and we put it together in a document in the form of guidelines. This is an extract from one of those guidelines documents. It belongs to the Java tech stack and it covers a very concrete area, namely, how to implement the circuit breaker pattern in Java. If you do not know what a circuit breaker is, please ask me in the Q&A after the presentation because it's a very interesting topic. A few things to note here. Not all the guidelines have the same strength. 
this one is a recommendation, which means that engineering teams at Atlassian are strongly encouraged to follow it, unless they have a good reason to choose differently. A few other guidelines are mandatory, and those are reserved for the rules that are essential to ensure interoperability among our services. Note how the recommendation explicitly indicates which technology to use and which ones to avoid, and it explains why. This is based on the experience accumulated by the teams at Atlassian and the signals that we pick from the industry. And finally, on the left side, it says that this recommendation was recently changed. This is because the guidelines are living documents that are regularly updated. For example, we used to recommend Hystrix, and now we recommend Resilience for J as our preferred implementation of the circuit breaker pattern in Java. Let's see some of the value that the uh, use of standardized tech stacks unlock. Firstly, they enable economies of scale. The number of engineers at Atlassian has been continuously growing, but the number of tech stacks remains constant. That means that the value of shared libraries and tools increases because uh, they can be used in, again and again in hundreds of services. Secondly, having a limited set of tech stacks improves collaboration. That's because engineers can understand and contribute to other teams' services. An engineer can move to a different team and be immediately productive without a technology learning curve. Services can be transferred to a different team when teams are reorganized. Thirdly, we learn faster. Engineers can teach each other what they have learned by means of uh, internal training sessions or by publishing blog posts in the internet or by just supporting each other in chat rooms or pull requests. Finally, it is important to maintain a healthy balance between standardization and experimentation. Teams are encouraged to experiment with other technologies besides the ones uh, that are recommended, especially on low risk projects like internal tools, and then share what they have learned. This is how the guidelines are kept fresh. For example, a couple of years ago, our backend tech stack did not include Kotlin. Java was the only recommended language for the JVM after a few missteps with some other JVM languages. Then some teams inside the company started experimenting with Kotlin for microservices and the results were very encouraging. As a result, our guidelines have re been recently updated to recommend Kotlin as a first class language for new microservices. But converging on a few tech stacks was not enough. We soon encountered another challenge. When creating a new service, it is tempting to clone an existing service prune the parts that are different, keep all the scaffolding, and start adding the new logic. This is because even with modern frameworks, there is still a lot of overhead. As Professor Labra said in the previous presentation, a service is much more than it's just, um, just it's Java or Python source code. There are build scripts, pom files, configuration files, documentation, and more. You also have to set up your CI CD pipeline, which even in the best case, it still requires writing some configuration as code. We realized that uh, we needed to support service owners at service creation time and, we, and also with the ongoing maintenance of the service during its lifetime. Let's focus first on the creation of a service. We started with a vision. Teams should be able to go from an idea to a working service skeleton in production in just minutes. That skeleton should not contain anything that you don't want or that is repeated. So teams uh, can focus just on adding the bits that make that service unique. We turn that vision into a tool called Instant Micros. It is a web application that bootstraps new services uh, for the Micros platform. It makes service creation as simple as ordering a pizza. The first step is to select one of the text tags from the menu. My favorite one is Spring Boot, so I'm going to go with that. After making that selection in the next screen, there are more options. For example, there is a choice to be made between Java and Kotlin, as I said, and also between Gradle and Maven. There are a few other questions like uh, where should the code repository be created or the most difficult question of all, the name of the new service. And then by pressing a button in just a few seconds, the service skeleton is created and pushed to the bucket, including a CI CD pipeline that builds and deploys the service. 
making it simple, fast, and self-service to create new services has many benefits. Do you have a new idea? Just press a few buttons and you can start prototyping it. In fact, we see large spikes in the use of instant micros approximately every three months when Atlassian celebrates Shipit, and suddenly on the same day, dozens of new services are created. Shipit is our regular hackathon with more than 10 years of tradition. Instant Micros is not just about dev speed. There are also architectural benefits. Here is one. Before we introduced Instant Micros, there was a strong temptation to add more code to the monolith in order to avoid the ceremony of having to set up a new service. But now that creating a new service is quick and easy, that eliminates one of the barriers for the composition of the monolith. Instant Micros helps teams at service creation time. But as I said a minute ago, we also have to consider the cost of maintaining the service. That includes tasks like uh, applying security updates or updating um, the service to uh, reflect the changes in the platform. For that purpose, we created some shared libraries. For example, if you are familiar with Spring Boot, you may have heard of starters, which extend the framework for particular tasks. We created one of those starters called Micros Spring Boot. And as the name suggests, it adapts uh, the Spring Boot framework to our platform Micros. It understands the environments, the security model, the metrics, etc. As a service owner, I can use that starter in order to keep my service secure and compatible with the Micros platform. These uh, shared libraries are also vehicles to promote best practices, for example, resiliency and security based on lessons that we have collectively learned the hard way. So, so far in our journey, I have talked about building a secure platform to deploy services, helping teams to make good technology choices, and reducing the cost of creating and maintaining services. But that's not the end of the story. The last challenge was about running those services. How to deploy changes quickly, while at the same time keeping the services reliable? When we began our journey, we used to have a dedicated operations team, but we could not make that model to scale, so we had to abandon it. And instead, we adopted a different one in which small teams have complete ownership of their services, including the architecture, implementation, and operations. Today, many teams at Atlassian have adopted the you build it, you run it model from Amazon. Engineers like me write code during the day and carry the pager at night. When things break, we are on call and we are the first responders. But you cannot simply come one day to the office and tell the developers, hey, you are now on call for your service. As the DevOps movement tells us, it is necessary to close the feedback loop and create an environment that allows teams to learn and improve. We did that in a number of ways. Firstly, we have a readiness checklist to make sure that we do not forget anything important before launching a new service. For example, a service must have a plan to cope with expected load in the near future. Secondly, we wrote an incident handbook because when things go wrong and there is a crisis, we do not want to improvise. Our incident handbook is publicly available uh, in the address that appears on the screen in case you want to steal it. Thirdly, when bad things happen, and they will, we conduct blameless postmortems. We do not cover up mistakes. Instead, we encourage honest and open analysis to find the root cause. By analyzing what went wrong, we identify improvement actions. In the same handbook, you can find the template that we use for this analysis and examples of some of our postmortems. Managers also participate in the postmortem process, not to point fingers to culprits but to sign off the conclusions and make time for the team to complete the improvement actions. And finally, even when there are no incidents and things are going well, teams hold what we call tech ops meetings. It is a weekly ceremony in which each team review together all the alerts they receive in the previous week and some of the important metrics of their services. One of my favorite metrics is the number of alerts received by the on-call person. Here is the chart corresponding to my team. The on-call roster rotates every week, so each data point in this chart corresponds to a different on-call person. Over time, what we see is that teams that follow these processes tend to receive less and less alerts, 
as the services become more resilient and the monitoring becomes less noisy. Let's review the value unlocked by this decentralized operations model. Firstly, it is transparent. Teams define their objectives for their services, like availability or latency, and everyone can see how they are tracking. Secondly, it creates an environment of trust where people are not afraid of speaking up about the risks or about what actually went wrong and how we can fix it. Thirdly, you wouldn't believe how motivated developers are to think about reliability when we have to carry the pager the next weekend. Reliability becomes part of the conversation in code reviews, and new patterns emerge, like feature flags or circuit breakers, which reduce the deployment risk and minimize the impact of failures. And finally, by eliminating the central operations team, we scale horizontally to as many teams and services as necessary. That concludes for now the story of how Atlassian went from our first service to approximately 1,000 services in production today. To recap, we encountered four challenges. Four challenges. Firstly, we needed a secure platform to deploy our services. For that, we built our own platform as a service called Micros and a security protocol called ASAP. Secondly, we converge on a small number of technologies in order to enable knowledge reuse. Thirdly, we build tools and libraries to quickly create and cheaply maintain a large number of services, so growth would not slow us down. And finally, we adopted DevOps principles to scale our operations and allow our teams to learn and improve. This was our journey. Other companies are following similar journeys. In our case, for example, we had to develop our own tools like Micros and ASAP because at the time we couldn't find uh, anything that we could use. But today, you can choose from some excellent alternatives available in the market, like uh, Kubernetes. When I look back, what I see is that the number of services at Atlassian has grown much faster than the number of engineers. In other words, the ratio of services per engineer has been increasing and is now approximately one to one. I believe this trend will continue into the future with smaller services and lambdas to the point where the number of deployables will largely exceed the number of engineers. I'm sure that will come with new exciting challenges, and I hope that uh, someday you will have the chance to come to Australia to help us write in the next chapters of this story. But for today, that's a wrap, and I will be happy to take your questions now. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Th thank you. C can you hear me? Hello? Yep, oh, I hear you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Diego. I mean, it would be nice to applaud you, but <laughs> it will be difficult with uh, in this kind of uh, conference. But uh, thank you very much for your conference and your talk. I mean, I have several questions uh, that I would really like to do, but maybe uh, it's a good opportunity to first uh, ask if someone wants to, to give a question, and then I have a battery of questions that I already have. So let's see if someone wants to, to start to do a question. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to ask uh, Diego a question. Hi, Diego. I'm, I'm Diego too. Hi, <laughs> maybe, Diego. <laughs> maybe can you see me now? Um, I'd like to ask you, um, well, it's fine. You develop uh, a lot of new tools for uh, microservices deploying and management. Uh, have you um, have you think about uh, moving to a standard solutions or are you going to keep um, uh, using your own tools? Uh, we are uh, very interested in moving to uh, standard solutions. So, for example, we have our eyes our eyes on uh, Kubernetes. Uh, we would like to uh, um, uh, try to migrate uh, most of what uh, Micros currently does to uh, Kubernetes. Uh, we are also um, in the in the process of uh, evolving our platform to be more like a service mesh, in which uh, services, uh, the boundaries between services are maybe less uh, defined, and uh, essentially you have uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, services, but also sidecars and uh, proxies and things like that, that uh, together they combine to produce the, the result that you want. And in order to, to realize that vision of the service mesh, we are also using uh, open source uh, solutions like uh, the Envoy proxy. 
Okay. Uh, another question. It was great that you uh, put your screen when you did the question, but I mean it's not mandatory, but it was a good thing to so you can see your face. Another question. Uh, Hi, hello. Um, hello, Diego. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Ivan. How are you? Fine, fine. Thanks. Uh, it was a really, really interesting uh, presentation. I have like a couple of, of questions. One is regarding the data storage. Uh, you were splitting, you were dealing with uh, hundreds of different databases, hundreds of different schemas, or what's the best approach to that? Uh, we have a bit of everything. Um, our uh, big monoliths like Jira and Confluence uh, are backed by uh, 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 Postgres databases running on top of uh, AWS RDS. Uh, and they are those databases are uh, sharded and uh, multi-tenant, which means that uh, we have many databases, but not as many as customers. We same databases. Uh, uh, server is uh, used by multiple customers. Uh, most of the new microservices are cloud native that have been uh, developed or, or over the last uh, few years. They come with their own database. We typically use things like DynamoDB, which is a AWS uh, a key value store, uh, similar to, to Cassandra. You may have uh, uh, heard of Cassandra. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, each service has its own database. Uh, in some cases, multiple databases. And uh, uh, as I said, the burden of uh, uh, doing things like backups uh, is uh, uh, is uh, dealt with uh, by the Micros platform. So for the developers, the owners of the services, the cost of maintaining those databases is relatively low. So they, they create as many databases as necessary. Okay, um, there were three questions, uh, sorry. Uh, the second question is, uh, how do you handle the distributed transactions? We don't do the distributed transactions. Uh, uh, okay, uh, that's right. Yeah, so distributed transactions, uh, uh, the moment you move away from the monolith, uh, they are very difficult to implement, so we uh, just don't implement them. What we do is we embrace principles like uh, eventual consistency, uh, where uh, uh, you perform operations, uh, but you uh, cannot uh, make assumptions about the uh, availability of the, of the data immediately after you perform an operation in the database. So for example, you may write some data to the database and then try to read it and the data is not there. Uh, so it will be eventually there, but maybe not immediately. Uh, and you have to deal with that, which means that, for example, if you are uh, performing an operation that mutates the data, you may want to do things like uh, optimistically update the uh, user interface to pretend that the data has been created and saved to the database. Because if you try to save the data and then fetch the data again in order to present it to the customer, uh, you may not find it. <laughs> okay. And the last question is uh, regarding the APM uh, of the code and so on. Are you using any specific tool? Have you prepared something in house or what's what's behind that? Sorry, what did you say? Uh, APM? Uh, re regarding the, the APM for the profiling of the of the code is not necessarily related yeah. to microservices, but I'm interested in the topic. Yeah, so we have experimented with a number of tools. Um, uh, we have a number of uh, tools that we have developed internally. We also use commercial tools, uh, sometimes like New Relic. Uh, most of uh, the observability these days, we do it with uh, tools like uh, SignalFX, uh, that is uh, sim similar to Datadog. It's uh, a, an application that allows you to aggregate metrics and uh, display the values. Right. Uh, most services don't need to do profiling all the time uh, because they are relatively small and uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the profiling of, uh, for example, Java applications is uh, typically a, a problem that uh, affects more the big monoliths uh, than the small microservices. Okay, uh, thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, 
uh, more questions. Uh, I, I have one question about the size of teams and how many uh, people are in a team. Uh, what is, I mean, if they are multidisciplinary teams, for example, uh, I, I can imagine that there is someone from databases, from another from user interface, another uh, which is uh, uh, developers and kind of things like that. So what is the, the size of teams and how and one person, uh, how many services uh, is usually responsible for? I mean, is one person is working on one service or several services at the same time, or how do you manage that? Okay, uh, so the team size, uh, I think like many of our peers in the industry, we have adopted the two pizza model of uh, Amazon, which means that the teams are only as large as you can fit with the two pizzas. Uh, that typically means uh, between five and seven people per team. Uh, it, those five and seven people, uh, you will typically have uh, a, a mix of uh, different specialists. Uh, you may have uh, some uh, front-end specialists, some back-end specialists, uh, full stack. Uh, for the database, the back-end engineers have to deal with the database. We don't have uh, database engineers or anything like that. Uh, then around the engineers in the team, we have uh, other team members. For example, of course, we have a team leader. We also have a, a product manager which uh, uh, represents the customer and decides priorities and uh, organizes the backlog. We have designers uh, that uh, help us with uh, uh, improving the user experience. We have uh, uh, document writers or technical documentation writers that uh, uh, allow us to get the text right, both the text that appears on the screen and the manuals and all of these things. Um, then we have uh, uh, other roles uh, that uh, typically are uh, share between multiple teams, so things like uh, architects, for example. Uh, we don't have an architect per team. We have uh, uh, architects that have responsibility over a number of teams. Um, I think I forgot the second part of your question. No, the second part was uh, if a per I see one of those persons is working for one service or oh, uh, yeah. five it, services at the same time, cardinal. or how? Yes, yeah. how do you work with that? So uh, we currently have a, a ratio of approximately one to one between engineers and services because uh, we have roughly uh, a thousand engineers, sorry, a thousand services and more than a thousand engineers, but uh, uh, we not all of them are working for our cloud uh, products. Uh, the, this is this is increasing. The, for example, the, the team that I work most um, uh, closely with uh, is a team of uh, nine people and they currently own nine services so I would say that they are uh, right on the on the average uh, but that that can be very flexible for example some teams own a large number of uh, small services or services that are in maintenance mode that are not seeing really active uh, development they are just uh, they just work they do their thing so you uh, if you don't need to you don't touch them uh, while in other cases, for example, you have a, a feature teams that are where you have multiple engineers working on a, one or two services because they are building something uh, completely new on top of those services. Okay, and uh, another question about that: uh, do, Does people move from one service to another or from one team to another? I mean, do you have mobility between them? Uh, does it happen that, for example, one service is abandoned because the people who were implementing it and they just decided that they didn't like? I, for example, I imagine that someone likes uh, uh, Kotlin and now he decides that he doesn't want to maintain a Java code anymore. These kind of things, uh, how do you handle that? Uh, we absolutely have the, those situations. Um, that, that's one of the reasons we uh, decided to uh, uh, to implement this idea of the reduced number of tech stacks. So uh, most of our services use the same technologies. We uh, have a, like a Java tech stack that includes Java and Kotlin. We have a Python tech stack, a Go tech stack, and a JavaScript Node.js tech stack. Uh, which means that yeah, if you if uh, uh, chances are that most of the services are going to be written in one of those languages. Uh, people move between teams all the time. We reorganize teams all the time. Uh, as you can imagine, on a company that is uh, growing this fast, 
the teams are reorganized uh, every every other week. Um, and services also uh, move between teams because, uh, as I said, uh, maybe at some point they are under active de development, but then they go through a period of hibernation. So you want to move them to a different team so to free some of the engineers to do something else. Um, we have suffered a lot with uh, services that were written in languages or with frameworks that are not mainstream. Um, and uh, yeah, in particular, things like um, Scala or uh, Clojure, for example, uh, have been a, a bit of a, of a problem because uh, it's expertise on those uh, languages is not uh, widespread. Hiring is uh, really difficult. And uh, when the people who created those services move on to um, other responsibilities or other projects, uh, it may be very difficult to find uh, someone to replace them. Uh, the, our experience, for example, shows that uh, ramping up, learning um, enough to uh, be able to be effective as a maintainer of a service in a language like Scala it requires many months. And that's assuming that you are going to be working elbow to elbow with uh, someone who knows everything about Scala and about the service and you can learn from them. Um, that's one of the reasons uh, it's uh, over time we are becoming a bit more strict with uh, uh, making sure that uh, we don't uh, select exotic technologies and uh, we try to uh, find the balance between being open to new ideas and, uh, and new languages, but also considering that uh, uh, most of the cost of a service comes not from its development, but from its maintenance over the many years. Okay, great. Um... Well, I, I wanted to, to ask you what what is a principal engineer? What how, what is how do you define your position there? And what, and also, I would really like to know what is your experience about your formation here at the University of Oviedo? What how, what do you think? Do you think it was good enough to work in Atlassian there, or what do you think? So those two questions about what is your role there, and also how do you feel about your formation? Okay, I'm glad that you asked those questions because they are exactly the ones that we prepared. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, my current role is principal engineer. Uh, a principal engineer at Atlassian, it's, uh, a, it's uh, a role that is uh, a one step after uh, a senior engineer. It's equivalent to architect. Uh, architect. Uh, in fact, we have both architects and principal engineers. Uh, both of uh, those roles are at the same level. The difference between them is that, uh, in theory, a principal engineer uh, remains closer to the code, uh, while an architect it's, uh, works a bit more in the abstract. In practice, we uh, all of us do everything. So uh, I, I think there is very little difference between a principal engineer and an architect. Uh, what makes the difference between a principal engineer and a senior engineer? Uh, a senior engineer it's uh, regarded as the most productive member of a team. So you, if you're a senior engineer, you're uh, assumed to be the person who uh, writes and reviews uh, a lot of code for the team, right? Complete is, uh, completes uh, the most number of tasks and things like that. Principal engineer instead uh, is not tied to the uh, sprint work of the team. Uh, the principal engineer, uh, as a principal engineer, your responsibility is to have an impact across the multiple teams. Uh, for example, a whole department or the whole company. And for that, uh, you need a very different set of skills. A senior engineer has to be very good at coding. A principal engineer or an architect has to be good at the, you know, the soft skills because you need to, uh, most of your work is about uh, talking to other people to uh, convince them to do the things that you think are right for the for the company. Right? The examples of the things that I do as a principal engineer is I I maintain some shared libraries that uh, many people in Atlassian use. Uh, I do, as I said, I do architecture work that involves designing and specifying a piece of work, doing estimate of uh, large projects, uh, identifying uh, the, the most important decisions that need to be made early on and uh, making sure that uh, that we made those decisions after hearing all the all the inputs. 
And uh, also there is a, uh, an aspect of uh, uh, mentoring. So uh, I'm, uh, as a principal engineer, I'm uh, uh, one of the uh, people in the company that has been there for longer, that has more years of experience, which means that I have made more mistakes than anyone. And I uh, have to transmit what I have learned to others so they don't have to repeat my same mistakes. And, and I do that by having one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, uh, other engineers, uh, jumping into code reviews and uh, providing guidance and uh, 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 advice to avoid uh, common pitfalls. Uh, I organize internal uh, training sessions. Uh, yeah, uh, a number of, uh, of mechanisms to transfer the knowledge. Uh, and uh, what did I learn at the, the university that helped me with my, with my work? Uh, well, one thing that I noticed um, in the Sydney office in Atlassian, we are uh, approximately uh, 1,500 people. Uh, so it's a lot of people. And uh, last time that we counted, I think it was like 70 or 80 different nationalities. So we have a sample of people from all over the world and from many universities and also people that do not have a university degree. Uh, when I compare myself to uh, other engineers that are coming from uh, universities from all over the world, what I find is that the education that I received uh, is probably broader as in we touch more things. Uh, maybe uh, the people coming from other universities are more specialized in a narrow field, uh, but maybe they lack a bit more on uh, this uh, uh, breadth of knowledge. So, for example, some conversations I have been uh, uh, surprised with, uh, because uh, uh, someone who is really smart and knows everything about you know, uh, a particular area maybe uh, doesn't have any idea of uh, how a CPU works internally or uh, something about the statistics or things like that. Um, I, 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 I find myself applying every day things that I learned uh, during my years at the uni. Uh, things that, uh, even things that uh, I thought I would never use, like uh, statistics, for example, for metrics, as I said, for dashboards, for experiments, uh, even to investigate incidents, uh, you need to, to be fluent in metrics. Um, also, uh, I learned in the, uh, in the uni about uh, how to do performance analysis, and that comes out every absolutely every day. Uh, you also need a solid foundation in things like uh, compilers and a, a theory of programming languages, type systems, functional programming, because, uh, as I said, we use multiple languages, and you need to be able to navigate between them and uh, learn new things. Okay, thank you very much for those words. Okay, there were maybe the other people who wants to ask questions. Uh, does anyone else wants to? Hi, <laughs> I don't know if you can see me. Yes. Hi, yes. Cool. Yes, we can see yeah. you. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions. Um, one is that uh, since you've grown so much and you have so many services so do, do you now have like a, um, a list of uh, metrics and and thresholds that every single service needs to have before they can be put into production or is each team that is developing the service came up with its own list or is there any kind of a standardized process for that or is a little bit more like you know if, if you are creating the service you decide what you want uh it's a bit of both. There are guidelines. So, for example, we have a, a tiering system for our services where we have a tier three services for things that, you know, if they break for a day, no one is going to notice or cancel the subscriptions or anything like that. Uh, then you go up in the scale to tier zero services. Uh, if those services are down for 30 seconds, uh, we are going to have lots of support cases. Uh, which each uh, one of those tiers comes with uh, a recommended set of uh, uh, objectives for their metrics. So, for example, uh, for tier zero services, uh, I think the goal is to have a reliability of uh, four nines. So, 99.99% of the time, the service has to be up. Uh, and yeah, same thing with uh, availability and uh, latency and these kind of things. Within those guidelines, of course, uh, there is room for uh, negotiation between the teams, right? So if uh, if you are the owner of a service and uh, some of the teams comes to you and says, I depend on you, 
and uh, uh, I'm not being able to, uh, to deliver on my promises to the customers because your service is maybe not reliable enough, then there's a negotiation there uh, to say, well, probably that service needs to be uh, at a different tier or at least increase, uh, for example, reduce the latency or something like that. And um, I'm guessing that you're using continuous deployment. So do you have like different regions, like geographical regions, and you deploy first on one and then see, wait for some time, see if everything is fine. If everything is fine, you go to the next region or or do you deploy everything at once? Uh, is, is that even a standardized or every team decides? I don't know, I'm just curious about how do you handle those situations? Uh, everything decides. Uh, the trend is that uh, most services are uh, nowadays are multi-region. Uh, in some cases, I think uh, we have six, we are using six uh, AWS regions. Um, and uh, we can, in many cases, we can serve customer traffic in from any of those regions. In some of the cases, uh, the data is sharded, so uh, the customers can only be served from one of those regions, but uh, in many other cases, the data is globally replicated. Um, it, we do progressive rollouts. Uh, we do, uh, uh, first we roll out to Canaries, then uh, we incrementally uh, shift traffic from the old version to a new version. And we use uh, uh, what we call PDBs, post deployment verifications, which are automated tests that are running uh, alongside the deployment. And if uh, any of the metrics, for example, the error ratio or the latency goes off the charts uh, when you convert the old version to a new version, then the rollout is automatically canceled um, and you don't have to do anything. Cool. And the last one is um, what's normally the, the, the ramp up period for a new hire? So if, if you were to hire a new person, how long will that process be? When you will expect that person to be a productive member of the team and not have to be, you know, unholding that person? <laughs> Great question. Um, when I joined seven years ago, uh, we had a boot camp where the new hires were removed from their teams for like six weeks. Uh, so the first six weeks, you didn't even see your teammates. And then, uh, personally, I think I didn't feel productive until six or maybe 12 months after I got the job. Right? There was just too much to learn. Uh, nowadays, we try to streamline that process and uh, the t uh, new hires sit with their teams from day one. And uh, we do whatever it takes to uh, have them making some changes, obviously with a lot of guidance and uh, mentoring uh, in their first week. So hopefully within the first or second week, they have deployed even a tiny change to production. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that they are productive immediately. Uh, that means that, yeah, for the next few months, they are still going to require a lot of guidance because as I said, in a company of this size and uh, uh, where you can you, you cannot expect people to uh, uh, to come with uh, all the experience that they, that is required. You cannot uh, give them a book because the books have not been written yet. Uh, so you need to transfer that knowledge person to person. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Uh, more, more questions? Uh, does anyone has a question? I mean, we need probably to close in three, four minutes because I have to, to teach another course, but uh, I would like to, to do well, for, for other people if they have questions to, to raise it. Okay, Diego, do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, I, I have uh, some more questions for Diego too. Um, when when Atlassian moved from monolithic to services, um, he also moved to from running the now the RAM servers to, to the cloud. Uh, what was uh, harder? The, yeah, the, the change in software or the change in 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 in, in computing provider. I mean, and and in the in the line of this, uh, are you worried to be too too tight to your cloud provider? Uh, great questions. Um, so yeah, we uh, some years ago when we were starting, uh, we had the monoliths running uh, our own data centers, so we own the hardware. Uh, and uh, uh, we decided that we wanted to uh, move to AWS. Um, so there was a transition there. That transition happened before we really decomposed the monolith. Uh, in fact, we are still decomposing the monolith. Uh, we have already extracted a thousand services <laughs> out of the monolith, but there is still much more to be decomposed. Uh, we 
we did a bit of the composition during the uh, migration to AWS, but uh, we deferred a lot. We said, well, that it's already hard enough to move to uh, the cloud. Uh, let's first do that, and then we continue the, the decomposition. Uh, are we concerned about uh, uh, being bound to AWS? Well, uh, we are with the industry leader, so that gives us uh, uh, some confidence that uh, AWS is not going anywhere. Uh, it's not going to disappear tomorrow. We, yeah, no, we. I, use I, I mean, no, no. I we know we all know it's not going to, to disappear. But maybe tomorrow they decide to triple the price for you. And you have to have a plan to move along to another provider. Absolutely, we. Uh, I think uh, efforts like uh, what I was saying before of uh, moving to Kubernetes or Service Mesh should help us in that uh, in that direction. Right? They, they will give us a bit of uh, uh, abstraction on top of the platform. That being said, uh, we are heavily invested in things like uh, the databases that uh, that AWS provides, like DynamoDB the message queues that they provide, the streaming services like uh, Kinesis, and uh, it would be a massive uh, enterprise to uh, to uh, uh, decide to move to a different provider. We have a very good relation with AWS, so we are, we are not uh, particularly concerned with that. And just two, two little more questions. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, Atlassian is no longer a startup. It's nope. a big, successful <laughs> company, and the bigger you are, the slower you become. So, are you worried on this? Yeah. So, uh, 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 this is something that uh, that we spend a lot of effort uh, on. Uh, we don't want to uh, slow down. Um, definitely, things are more complex today, uh, just because of the massive amount of the uh, of um, you know, the, the, the size of the company. When I joined, uh, it was still a point where essentially everyone knew it, everyone else, and uh, you could know you could find someone that could help you because uh, uh, you know uh, this is this person who is doing this thing um, today. With and, uh, and you knew and you knew everyone because you you took them some beers with a with a cart. Yes, yes, that's that's, <laughs> that's uh, correct. But today, with uh, like more than four thousand people in the company, it's uh, completely impossible to uh, to know the people that uh, that is doing uh, the things. Right? Um, so what we do is uh, to try to give autonomy to the teams. Uh, as I said, uh, teams are responsible for uh, architecture, uh, implementation, operations. So the scope of the decisions does not have to be four thousand people. We can make decisions uh, localized. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as we have some guidelines to make uh, to ensure that uh, the localized decisions then uh, lead to a something that, to a puzzle that we can put together. And your answer leads me to the next question. Um, Atlassian bought a lot of companies. Um, those teams and those products are now considered legacy or are being um, recycled into Atlassian way of doing things and. Uh, yeah, and their products are being rewritten using your new tools, or are just kept there and just let let them life until they no longer are being used? We uh, uh, it's, it's correct that Atlassian has bought uh, many products over the years. Uh, some of them uh, quite popular, like Trello and Obzini. Uh, we we love those products, and uh, it was very clear for us that uh, we didn't want. To disrupt what they were doing, the, what the, because no, they were successful, no. they were growing. Don't 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 repair what it what is not broken, right? Exactly. <laughs> so it's not that we said, well, now you are part of Atlassian. Stop everything that you that was making you very successful because you have to now do the things the, the Atlassian way. Uh, no, we are very deliberate about uh, slowly integrating those uh, those uh, products with uh, the rest of the Atlassian products. So, for example. Uh, these days, you can already log in using your Atlassian account credentials to products like Trello or Bitbucket, but it took uh, us a while to get there. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, you know, we have some cider uh, waiting for, for you next time you come here. I uh, would love to, <laughs> to have that cider. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I